half, this reflects having diverged from a common ancestor, which used that so the common ancestral population that used the same technology. It was propelled forward in the two branches. Neanderthals specialized in that technology in Europe and Western Asia. And then, when anatomically modern humans begin to penetrate into Europe towards the end of the Neanderthal reign, they bring with them some, apparently, some cultural innovations in the way stone tools are made, the use of non-stone materials for tools like bone, and even decorative materials like shell and so forth. And at a few very late Neanderthal sites in Europe, especially in Spain, in the western part of Europe, around 30, 35,000 years ago, we find Neanderthal fossils with some of these more advanced techniques of, of tool manufacture mixed in with their inherited stone tool manufacture in the posterior. Now, some people have said this is Neanderthals becoming more sophisticated. Other people have said it reflects interaction between the populations. The Neanderthals were, were not stupid. They incorporated some aspects of the, of the material culture of groups coming in that they may have encountered into their own culture. It's not, and this is called the Upper Paleolithic, by the way, the, the, the more modern culture. So there are Upper Paleolithic cultural elements mixed in with the traditional Neanderthal um, stone tool manufacturer of the Mysterian, and that's, that's what we see in the very latest stage of the, of the Neanderthal reign in Europe. Does that, that answer your question?
years of anabama, and for you know, 100 years or more, they were considered by most biologists to be very good species. Well, it turns out, uh, when you study them in the wild, where they come together, where their range, geographical ranges come together, they interbreed like crazy. And they form these so-called hybrid zones, like zippers, along their adjacent geographical margins. Now, that's what happens today. What's important, however, is what happens a million years from now. And it's very difficult to predict, based on a hybrid zone, whether the continued interbreeding of populations along the zone of contact, whether that, whether that results in genes penetrating into the parent populations to the point where they lose their distinctiveness. Right. And that, from an evolutionary point of view, would be the interesting story. Right. The fact that they may interbreed either it will happen or it won't happen. And it's something that only, only time and further study will tell. Hi. Um, do you know of any research where uh, if you have, say, a tribe of Neanderthals living nearby a tribe of humans, is there any characteristic of the Neanderthals, physical or otherwise, that the humans would be able to look at them and say, no, immediately, they're not us. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we need that time machine. There's only one geographical location. Well, there's only one geographical location where there is ample evidence of Neanderthals and anatom anatomically modern humans, like that one skull I showed, it's 110,000 lived in the same area, and that's in the Middle East. But the unfortunate fact for the answer to your question is, is that all the Neanderthals in that period, or in that uh, area, range in age between around 50 and 70,000, and all of the so-called anatomically modern humans in that area are 90,000 or older. So they're in the same place, but they're not in the same time. Now in Europe, we know from mostly the archeological record, which shows more modern, cultures coming in presumably from elsewhere around 50, 40,000. And then gradually we begin to pick up more modern looking skeletal remains about 30, 35,000. At 30, 35,000 we have anatomical modern humans living in the same broad areas as the last Neanderthals. But there's no place that I know of where you can excavate a cave and find Neanderthals here and anatomically moderns there, such that it would support the hypothesis of some bloodthirsty takeover or something like that. Um, don't have that evidence. So we can't say, either from a genetic point of view or a paleoanthropological point of view, what were the interactions of the populations when, if and when they actually came into contact. It's not given the climatic oscillations in glacial Europe during the Neanderthal rain. It's not inconceivable that the Neanderthals were becoming extinct come hell or high water, regardless of what the anatomical moderns were doing. It may very well be like the dinosaurs and the mammals. You know, the dinosaurs went extinct and the mammals moved into the empty niches. Maybe that's what's going on in a smaller scale with anatomical modern humans coming from Africa and the Middle East. Neanderthals were given up the ghost just about by the time they got there. They overlapped for a brief period of time. Neanderthals vanished, and what was left was us. Now, I would say that uh, some of the genetic modeling suggests that the time of the admixture between anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals was probably actually around 90 to 100,000 years ago, as opposed to more recently around 30,000. So it, it may, there may have.
lots of pig bones and decided to try to get DNA out of it because of the preservation. They felt that since it had been in an anoxic environment, perhaps that would, would work. Um, and right before that, someone had been able to get a little bit of DNA out of the skin of a museum specimen of a quagga, which is a, a now extinct uh, zebra thing. Uh, and it, that fragment looked like horses and zebras should. <laughs> uh, and it made a nice phylogeny, which matched with, with what was assumed. So that was considered a success. And the pig bone actually gave a sequence that matched with pigs. So it took off from there. I am embedded PCR, by the way. Won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, he won the Nobel Prize for it. It's kind of a nutter.